not. But men and women were sent into harm's way, thus as an obligation to take care of them. The same way with the uh, wars in uh, Afghanistan and Iraq. Iraq, uh, uh, Iraq, excuse me. Because those wars were wars that were prosecuted under uh, false pretenses. And we have the 9-11 scenario and that part of the cost of lives. And we could debate about the responsibility for that particular situation. But the consequences of it was billions of dollars spent and billions of dollars being spent on unnecessary uh, services. Now we have Homeland Security, a greater threat to the American people than Saddam Hussein ever was. And Saddam Hussein was not a threat at all. And we get into, not so much with troops, uh, into the uh, Libyan uh, campaign. So now the big debate is what happens with Wilsonian foreign policy, but much of this military build-up, drawdown, etc., is based upon the American foreign policy. You can't just simply isolate these factors from that. And in the uh, last presidential election, there was little really said about foreign policy other than D.J. Trump claimed he would uh, modify it. Now, perhaps there's less talk of modification uh, of a new foreign policy, but somewhat. But you see at the same time the Cold War relics, NATO, being expanded into Poland and various countries of that nature. Why is this happening? There is no threat to the EU, uh, period. But if we look at former states in the Soviet Union, those realignments and artificial realignments, yes, they will uh, continue. But the big question is how much money will be expended for those particular uh, situations. This will end our coverage as we honor the veterans, and we have to look back to the many veterans in the what was called World War I, etc. And we are always reminded of the uh, former Marine and his expose of the uh, military within it, uh, within itself, and why many of these adventurous type uh, situations occurred there. We we have to always think about that. Adventurism has never added up to nothing but adventurism, saving the world uh, for democracy. But the problem is, democracy itself is a very uh, tenuous situation. And when you have campaigns based upon the same values that Chicken Gruber popularized, and the greatest generation died to defeat, that is a step back in the American political psyche. And as you talk about the nation now divided, the healing process cannot start until there is an ideological um, correction. And that is not uh, happening uh, now as we see it in the streets uh, out there, people uh, protesting various uh, policies. You'd say, well, why are we talking about this on a day to honor the veterans? Because the whole circumference of veteran activities is in itself a political process to getting a vitamin tablet at the VA or a veteran being able to get just a simple physical examination. That is all about the politics and the workings of how government works. The inability of Congress to provide the funds is all about an ideological approach of the Republican Congress. And now 
it is completely on steroids. And that's what people uh, need to think about when we are honoring uh, these people and future people that will be placed in harm's way. And of the ordinary uh, citizen that will be placed in harm's way as we go back to these 70-year-old institutions and extend them into the lives of people in uh, the Mideast way out of Europe and then go to the old uh, USSR, the old Soviet Union, and get into the lives of those people, not for any military advantage, but for a commercial advantage. And when we look also to newer actors such as uh, China and where they uh, fit in to this whole uh, schism of what is called um, military uh, spending. Those are some reflections that we need to reflect about because if the more of the quote-unquote scarce allocation of budgetary resources for tanks, ships, carriers that are obsolete and not needed, the less there is for education, health care, and essential uh, social uh, programs. That we have not heard very much about. We've heard about cutting those social programs. But see, within that budget, there is very little money one can cut. Yes, they can cut WIC. They can cut food sufficiency, sufficiency, which used to be called uh, food or coupons or food stamps. Yes, they can cut aid to uh, children. which in, And that's a state program which has not been increased. Uh, We're looking at Wisconsin, uh, in uh, Milwaukee, and uh, the urban areas, rural areas. That type of uh, cash benefit has not changed since the 80s. And the underlying safety net is not there. They privatized even uh, the uh, government-provided housing into so-called vouchers. Now they're talking about vouchers and that is another thing for education and the public school system there's an excellent book we'll get into it later uh, by uh, I can't think of his name right now but it talks about affirmative action after the war now that affirmative action was aimed at the uh, European middle class or white middle class primarily but veterans were allotted on a GI bill to get loans, to uh, go to university, in many and uh, technical schools, and many took advantage of that. There were not as many ap- uh, opportunities for African Americans, but there were some, and that changed the entire course of not only the veterans' lives, but the lives of the people of the United States. Have a uh, pleasant day. And we'll talk to you on uh, the week that was. We also have a numbers man uh, coming up uh, this weekend uh, from uh, WBRN, who is bringing you this program and the Boston Red Network as we work to realign our uh, content uh, presentation to you. This is Boston Red on the 11th of November, Veterans Day. Happy Veterans Day to all veterans. 2016. Good day. Very best among us. A dogged sense of duty, indomitable courage, and plain American grit. President Obama admires that in Corey. He admires it in all American veterans. It's why he loves them. Ladies and gentlemen, our honored guest, the Commander in Chief, and the 44th President of the United States, Barack Obama. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Thank you. Secretary McDonald, Mr. Hallinan, distinguished guests, and most of all, our extraordinary veterans and your families. The last time I stood on these hallowed grounds on Memorial Day, our country came together to honor those who have fought and died for our flag. A few days before, our nation observed Armed Forces Day, honoring all who are serving under that flag at this moment. And today, on Veterans Day, we honor those who honored our country with its highest form of service. You who once wore the uniform of our Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, or Coast Guard. We owe you our thanks. We owe you our respect. And we owe you our freedom. We come together to express our profound gratitude for the sacrifices and contributions you and your family made on the battlefield, at home, and at outposts around the world. But America's gratitude to our veterans is something always grounded in something greater than what you did on duty. It's also an appreciation of the example that you continue to set after your service has ended. Your example as citizens. Veterans Day often follows a hard-fought political campaign an exercise in the free speech and self-government that you fought for. It often lays bare disagreements across our nation. But the American instinct has never been to find isolation in opposite corners. It is to find strength in our common creed, to forge unity from our great diversity, to sustain that strength and unity even when it is hard. And when the election is over, as we search for ways to come together, to reconnect with one another and with the principles that are more enduring than trans transitory politics, some of our best examples are the men and women we salute on Veterans Day. It's the example of young Americans, our 9-11 generation, who as first responders ran into smoldering towers, then ran to a recruiting center and signed up to surf. It's the example of a military that meets every mission, one united team, all looking out for one another, all getting each other's backs. It's the example of the single most diverse institution in our country. Soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and Coast Guardsmen who represent every corner of our country every shade of humanity, immigrant and native-born, Christian, Muslim, Jew, and non-believer alike, all forged into common service. It's the example of our veterans, patriots, who, when they take off their fatigues, put back on the camouflage of everyday life in America and become our business partners and bosses, our teachers and our coaches, our first responders, city council members, community leaders, role models, all still serving this country we love with the same sense of duty and with valor. A few years ago, a middle school student from Missouri entered an essay contest about why veterans are special. And this is what he wrote. When I think of a veteran, I think of men or women who will be the first to help an elderly lady across the street. I also think of someone who will defend everyone, regardless of their race, age, gender, hair color, or other discriminations. 
After eight years in office, I particularly